Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for all of you out there that are new and this is your first visit, welcome. Great to have you here. Make sure you hop on over to YouTube and subscribe to the Dadvice TV channel. Click that little bell icon. That way, every time I schedule another great video like what we're going to do tonight, you'll get a notification and won't miss any of them. Now, if you are new, let me briefly introduce myself. My name's James, I have kidney disease. I was diagnosed about oh, two and a half years ago, stage five, and told I needed to go on dialysis and I wouldn't get any better. Well, luckily my doctor was wrong. I worked on controlling my blood pressure, get my diet under control, exercising, and pretty much in general, living healthy. And as I got healthy, my lab started to improve. And now I'm around the stage three, stage four border, but I feel great. My kidneys are not stopping me from doing the things I wanna do. Now, tonight, we're gonna talk about something that I have never done, and that is a kidney biopsy. Now, when I was diagnosed, I spent a week in the ICU, and they wanted to do a biopsy, and I'm a super nerd. I ask a lot of questions. And I asked them, well, if you do it, is it gonna change the treatment that I'm gonna get? The doc said, nope, it's not gonna change anything. We're just gonna make sure we know what caused your kidney disease, but we're pretty sure we know. So I passed on it. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is all new to me. So we're all gonna learn together. Now, who are we gonna learn from? We're gonna learn from an expert all the way down in Texas. Welcome, Dr. Kasim Butt. Hey, Doc, how you doing? What's up, guys? How's it going? How y'all doing? Hey, doing fantastic. Now, for those that were seeing the chat before the show started, the Doc was having some tech issues with his Windows, not Mac, computer. <laughs> so he's actually calling in on his phone right now, and it looks great. I think the well, picture looks fantastic. Well, I'm really glad. So I had to turn on my fancy laptop to get it repaired. So I had my old school laptop. I think the software's old, so it doesn't doesn't vibe with James's fancy, you know, tech stuff that he does. So it just didn't work. You know, James's computer was like not worthy, not worthy, and so it kicked me off. So I'm just using my phone, guys. I'm just FaceTiming in essentially right now, so. Fantastic. Now for those that are new, tell them a little bit about yourself and they're gonna love you and tell them how they can learn more from you on social media. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Kasim, but I'm an interventional nephrologist and I also practice clinical nephrology. Um, I'm, I, I'm in practice in San Antonio, Texas. I've been a doctor for uh, 10 years now, I've been a nephrologist for 10 years. I am. Uh, highly uh, active on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, and Instagram. I make videos that you can understand. Three to five minutes long, try to make it fun, try to make it interesting, but directly about a topic so that you can absorb it easily. Not the same Dr. Gibberish that you guys hear when you go out there and you're just overwhelmed with fancy words and stuff. Uh, I try to break it down real simple so you can understand it. So after this or during this, please like, like, like me on those platforms. You can see my Ha my handle out there. I, there's no way you can be able to spell my name, but it's at Custom but MD. You can look me up on all those platforms. Yep, and we have links down below in the description to Dr. Butt's Facebook page, his YouTube channel, which you guys need to hop on over there, click subscribe, great stuff like Dr. said, short, easy to understand. That's probably the biggest part. And he adds in his own little style, a little bit of humor, so he can make something that's kind of technical and boring interesting and easy to understand. Now tonight, kidney biopsy. I get Ooh, so many people fun. asking about those and I passed on mine and yeah. I don't know, maybe I'll need one in the future, who knows? So I, I know so little about them. So let's start with the very basics. What the heck is a kidney biopsy? I'm gonna go over that. Let's start out with this, James. Let's uh -huh. ask your audience, because your audience is really involved, how many of y'all out there with kidney disease have had a kidney biopsy, and what was Ooh. your experience? Why don't you guys just type that in there, and then James can read them off, and we can see. I would really be curious to see how many people actually get it. Now, so what is a kidney biopsy, right? So a kidney biopsy is actually the most definitive, absolute way to know what's going on in your kidneys, right? Meaning we can check all these blood tests, we can do an ultrasound of your kidneys, we can do all this fancy stuff, but the only way to truly know 
um, is to actually go in there with a needle and stick it in your back, okay? Get a sample of that kidney out and then take a look at it under a microscope and then we can actually see exactly what's going on. That exactly what is a kidney biopsy. Now, with that needle going in your back, it's a big old needle, y'all. It's a big old needle. But, I saw it. <laughs> I've seen it. But, but I'll be fine, so don't worry about me, okay? So, um, but... <laughs> You want a so, nice, no, no. young, healthy doctor, not anyone who has the shakes for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. It is a big old needle. It does go in your back. The procedure itself is typically an outpatient procedure, although some people do get admitted overnight. You go into the hospital. What they do is give you some pain medications, uh, IV, to kind of make you kind of um, what, they, what they call conscious sedation, meaning they kind of just uh, no, don't put you to sleep, but they kind of take the edge off and make you woozy. Do you see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And then while you're there, they kind of calm you down. And then they go in there, numb your back area with some lidocaine in that back area. And then they take that needle, probe it directly into the kidney with the help of an ultrasound typically. And they use that ultrasound to guide the needle directly into your kidney, get the sample out, look at it under a microscope just to make sure we got actual, actual kidney tissue, not like muscle tissue or fat tissue or something else. And then once they do that, they take that sample out. They look at it, send it to a fancy pathologist, typically a kidney um, pathologist, that looks at those samples underneath an x-ray, look at, looks at the microscopic filters called nephrons, right? We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Nephron is the microscopic filter. is about, I think, about a million of them in your kidney, each kidney. So he takes a sample out, looks at those, uh, those filters, and sees where's the damage on there? How much is it damaged? Is it recoverable? Is it not recoverable? Is there some fancy autoimmune disease going on or is it just diabetes, okay? So this is stuff you can actually, uh, I, I, this is the best way to actually get the best diagnosis for your kidney, kidney disease, okay? Now, um, interestingly enough, I had a gentleman today, I got a call from a pathologist. This is hilarious, we're having this conversation literally about an hour, hour and a half ago. I got a call from the pathologist. They typically get the reports back within a week or two. So when you guys, if you guys are out there that had a kidney biopsy, it takes about a week or two for them to get the results back. And typically they call the nephrologist first just to give them the heads up. And they, the, the nephrologist, the, the kidney, um, the, the pathologist gave me a call when I was driving home. And he said, hey man, this person has what we call IgA nephropathy. That's a common kidney disease as well. Mm -hmm. but, but we've talked about this before, James, you know, the, you know, the biggest problem in America is high blood pressure and diabetes. So this person had IgA nephropathy. But he also had lesions of diabetes and high blood pressure in there. So it's interesting out there that even the people that are, have the lupuses and all these funny diseases and the polycystic kidney disease, guess what? Those diseases of diabetes and high blood pressure are still affecting your kidneys. Don't think you, you can just be one. Sometimes it can be multiple. Okay. I, I so never really patient, actually thought about that. But yeah, you're right. Of course you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was telling me, yeah, it's got some diabetes in there, got some high blood pressure, and it's mostly IgA and property. But you can see here where diabetes and high blood pressure still affect the kidney. And so you can have multiple lesions in the kidney. So it's interesting. But this is the best way. Now, so a lot of times... And that's actually um, pretty amazing that they can tell from the damage what likely caused it. I, I, yeah. I actually never, ever knew that. I just thought they went yeah. in there and they pulled out a little piece and determined pretty much how bad things were. Yeah, and, and they do. They, they can tell you how much scar tissue is built up and what areas that scar tissue is built up and all that cool stuff. But also, um, they can tell you what's weird is like these diseases, diabetes and high blood pressure, they act in different ways on the kidney and the nephron and all the vessels and stuff, blood vessels that are going in there. So they actually make specific lesions. So diabetes affects the kidney in one way. The high blood pressure affects it another way, Not uh, meaning like it as far as what kind of damage it does, right? Just yeah. imagine on the plumbing you know, if you had damage from, you know, corrosion, it's different than if you had damage from high pressure in the, in, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that there's different, different mechanisms out there by which damage is done to the kidneys. And so again, it's interesting. Um, those of y'all out there who have, and I'm really curious to see what your audience has. I mean, well, don't, 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 don't give out your personal information. Yeah. <laughs> we've had a handful of people say, yeah, they've, they've, they've had it. Um, yeah. Someone got it and it came back as, non -con or inconclusive and that can happen too and that can happen too and what's interesting is it depends on the quality of the sample too so you got to remember when we're going in there so it depends on where we're getting in the kidney are we getting in a healthy spot of the kidney are we getting in a in a scarred part of the kidney yep. um uh you know sometimes you go in at a weird angle are we getting enough of those nephrons in there 
um, to get a good sample. So sometimes that happens where you're getting inconclusive data from it. So typically it is the most um, definitive diagnosis, but guess what? Sometimes it may not render results. So. Now, how do they pick which kidney to poke? Okay, so that they take a coin and so they ask the patient to say head or, heads or tails, <laughs> and then <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not like what they do. <laughs> Essentially, what they do is just they go out there and they um, uh, they when they ultrasound the kidneys, they can tell which side is better. Do you see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So you guys, um, uh, you may have seen me here before, but when you go to one of us, a nephrologist, a kidney doctor out there, right? You're gonna get pretty much three tests, right? Or maybe four tests, but you're gonna get a what we call a renal panel where you get the BUN, creatinine, GFR calculated. Yep. You're gonna get uh, a, a, um, a CBC, which is checking how, how much anemia you have. You're gonna get a UA, urinalysis, which is gonna tell you if you have any blood or protein in there. And then you're gonna get a urine protein creatinine ratio, which is gonna tell, that's gonna quantify the amount of protein in your urine. And guess what? The last thing, that's the fourth thing, sorry, is a, you're gonna get a, a, renal, uh, a renal ultrasound, a kidney ultrasound, okay? Yep. And so that, when you get that kidney ultrasound, we're gonna see if that, those kidneys are nice, juicy, plump, and healthy, or are they small and scarred, right? And so by that, by that nature, that's gonna be one of the decisions why you may or may not get a biopsy. Like, remember we talked about you, James, right? Mm -hmm. Your kidneys were kind of small and scarred. Mine, right? mine were shriveled somewhat and scarred. Um, yeah. And they did so many ultrasounds. I had a uncontrollable cough, which made the mm -hmm. ultrasounds really difficult. I couldn't hold my breath for more than wow. a second or two without a so you you were, know, you were an pretty much a convulsion a cough. Queen, huh? What so was that? You were an ultrasound drama queen, huh? Oh yeah, let me tell you, I felt <laughs> so bad for them doing it. And I was say, I'm trying not to cough, and I'd be coughing while I'm talking. And they, they understood, but oh, it was um, difficult. <clears throat> yeah, and so one of the reasons that maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know your kidney doctors, but sometimes if the kidneys are so small and scarred, and that's what happens in kidney disease sometimes, I get you all late. Uh, sometimes I get you guys in mm -hmm. CKD stage four or five. At that time, the kidneys are so small and scarred that it may be dangerous for me to go in with a needle and poke it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. Because the tissue is maybe so scarred, it'll cause a lot of bleeding. It can cause what we call a hematoma, which is like a collection of blood behind the kidney. And so we, it's kind of a risk benefit analysis, meaning at this point, is sticking a needle in this human being going to do more better for them or worse for them? Right. Yep. And so oftentimes in late stage kidney disease, um, you know, we just say, OK, dude, I got you late um, and the kidneys are scarred. We just got to talk about preserving whatever you have left and maybe dialysis. And unfortunately, that's where we're at sometimes. And that's one of the reasons many of all may have not gotten biopsies. Yeah. And that's pretty much where I was. I was GFR eight. The yeah. things didn't look good. The doctor talked to me and said, I would like to do it. Um, they walked me through it. They showed me this needle thing which yeah. all I had to do was see it and know it was a no. <laughs> yeah. I don't like big needles. Oh, they um, showed you the needle, dude? They showed you the needle? Yeah, the, I, dude, I am such a nerd. I was like, I want to know exactly what you're doing. Do you have videos I can oh, watch? Because they had these yeah. iPads in the ICU with all sorts of videos and stuff to help you. And like, no, oh, but they cool. showed me this, this thing and it was giant, okay? It looked like yeah. it belonged in a turkey, not a person. Yeah. Um, but I asked, I said like, okay, well, if you, you know, they said there's some risk with my yeah. kidneys and I'm pretty sure they know what the problem is, but this would let them know for sure. And I asked them, if you do this, what would it change in my treatment? You know, based on what you see where I'm at right now. And they said, it's not going to change anything, but we'll know 100% for sure. So that's why I passed on it. Oh, um, wow. yeah. now if my kidneys were healthier, say I, I was, you know, three A. You know, yeah. doing pretty well. Just a little tiny bit of kidney disease. Um, what risk are there at that point to getting a biopsy? So look, look, before we go into the risk, there are risks. Okay, there mm -hmm. are risks. There's never anything that's without risk. But one of the main reasons, you know, and this is where it's kind of important, um, you know, uh, about getting a good clinical history. And this is where it's open, important that you as a patient, I made a video too about this three ways to improve your doctor's appointment, mm -hmm. but you guys can check it out. But you need to know your history you know, verbatim all, all the way through. Okay. Even your kid, kid, kid wide history, not like every little tiny thing. Like I had, you know, a cold at whatever age this, or, you know, little thing. But what I'm saying is major history kind of stuff you should know, 
because that gives me a, my, my, in my mind an idea of what's going on, right? And and that tells me if I'm, I'm going to need to do a biopsy, right? And again, it has risk, so we don't want to expose you to one if we don't absolutely have to. So what I mean by this and where I'm trying to get at is, let's just say, uh, James, we, you, you were my patient. You came to me for the first time and your GFR mm -hmm. was 35, right? If it was 35, man, and you told me, hey, uh, Dr. Buddy, you know, I've had diabetes for 30 years. I haven't really followed with many doctors. Um, you know, I have retinopathy in my eyes, meaning I have diabetes in my eyes, bleeding in the back of my eyes. From the, the from the diabetes, guess what? I've I've got numbness in my toes, diabetic neur neuropathy in my feet. Mm -hmm. um, that means the diabetes is likely attacked your feet, your the nerves in your feet and the blood vessels in your eyes. Guess what? It's probably attacked your kidneys too, and you probably have a little bit of protein, a little bit of blood in your kidney in your urine. And then by that history, I can judge. Hey, this guy likely has. Di uh, diabetes in a kidney. And then at this point, what we'll do is we'll order what we call serologies. So we want to order all these fancy tests, guys, fancy mm -hmm. tests. And what they do is with these fancy tests is we all want to eliminate any what we, uh, what we call autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are when the body attacks itself, right? And so when the body attacks itself, these are the lupuses, the vasculitis, all these weird autoimmune diseases. And so we do that panel. If that panel comes back negative, meaning no autoimmune disease detected, um, and uh, and the history meets up, typically I don't do a biopsy, right? I don't expose them. Um, just looking at, I'm in San Antonio, you know, um, we're uh, you're in Ohio. We got some big people there, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> we got yep. some big people that like soda, right? <laughs> big <laughs> so sodas like too. Big soda. We got we got tortillas <laughs> down here. So we got double carbs every meal, right? And so, so you know, diabetes is so rampant, especially among the Hispanic population here in San Antonio. And it doesn't mean I dis discount everything else. It's not that. Mm -hmm. I don't discount everything else. But if there's all this history pointing into one direction, diabetic nephropathy, diabetes, diabetic kidney, I am probably not going to biopsy, right? Maybe that's wrong. Uh, maybe I should be more aggressive with the biopsies. Maybe, you know, there's some data saying we should do it more often. Um, but that's how it goes. And that's why many of y'all out there may have not had a kidney biopsy because you went in with the history saying, you know, uh, I've had diabetes, I've had high blood pressure. And also your age counts too, right, James? You're 48, yep. right? Or something like that, right? 49. Oh, 49. 49, <laughs> 49 have, right? my mom's diabetic. My mom's stage oh, three. Yeah. I have... I had high blood pressure since my 20s. I, I yeah. had plenty of, yep, yep, yep. Those could cause kidney issues. Yeah. So what I'm trying to get at with you, it's a different story for different age groups, right? So that 70-year-old grandma um, has some protein in the urine and kidney function is not doing so good. I'm probably not going to kidney bi risk the biopsy to her because she's probably mm -hmm. on a what do you call anticoagulant, a blood thinner, like aspirin or Plavix and all this fancy stuff. And her lifespan is not as long, right? But for yourself, you're 49. If I'm really inquisitive and say, hey, man, I got to get down to it because you got a long lifespan ahead. You want to preserve your kidneys for as long mm -hmm. as possible. I may expose you to a kidney biopsy. Um, going back to your question, though, man, you actually asked about the risk. Yeah, for someone who's kind of healthy or healthier. Yeah, healthier. So there are risks, as I said. So you when you're sticking that needle into the back, you're sticking it into the kidney, you can cause a hematoma behind the kidney called a retroperitoneal hematoma, bleeding behind there. So you can have severe bleeding, internal bleeding. It's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is if you have, uh, if someone has say a single kidney, those, that, those are some people that don't get the biopsies. Some people are born with one kidney. Some people have lost a kidney because of cancer or had a mass on it. And so if they have a solitary kidney, only one kidney, we're probably in our minds as nephrologists not going to biopsy that one kidney just because we don't want to possibly hurt it. Do you see what yeah. I'm saying? Uh, and so that's another reason not to do it. So there are risks involved um, with uh, with kidney biopsies, and that's why sometimes we we don't do them. Now you kind of talked through the process. It sounded like is this an outpatient thing where I come into your office and you numb my back and and do it, or do I have to spend the night in the hospital? Is there like a recovery for a phase? So yeah, yeah. So dude, like, so you can do it. Typically, there's several ways. Some people are more comfortable admitting someone overnight and just washing overnight. Most places do it outpatient, meaning you just go in the morning, um, they watch you for a few hours afterwards, and they send you home. 
that's it. And awesome. it, you, know, you may have uh, some back pain afterwards. You may have a little bit of blood in your urine. That's a possibility mm -hmm. afterwards. You can see it. Um, but um, but typically, they don't keep you overnight. I actually, I don't do them. You know, I'm an interventional nephrologist. deal with blood and ac dialysis access stuff. I used to do them when I was a fellow in uh, at LSU in, in Louisiana. So I actually used to them. They train us to do them. But in, in private practice, we typically don't do the nephrologist doesn't do the biopsies. In private practice, typically we send you to the hospital where if usually an interventional radiologist does the procedure as an outpatient. And, and they do it in, in a hospital setting just in case, right? Yep. Just in case. So you don't want to come to my office and have me stick a big old needle in your, in your kidney. You don't want me to do that. You typically want to be in a facility that can handle, say, God forbid, something happens, goes wrong. And typically yep. it doesn't. It's a very minor procedure. But of course, you want to be in a facility just in case, right? Yep. And and the nephrologist is the one who requests this, not the patient. They can't say, you know, I I can't go to my doctor and say, Doc, you know what? I want a biopsy of my kidney. No. Yeah. Or, so like, no, no. That's where you. I mean, you can always suggest it. So one of the reasons I don't do kidney biopsies too is some patients are just apprehensive. The procedure mm -hmm. I just described can be overwhelming for people, right? Sticking a big old needle in your back. And some people are just really scared of that kind of thing. So if I have a good clinical history, uh, you know, and I have an idea what it could be, I'm like, dude, you're, you're cool, you know? But some people, if they really want that diagnosis, um, you know, I don't have a problem doing it. I don't have a problem doing it. Usually I'm looking for something that's significant though, right? In their history to say, mm -hmm. hey man, we really need to benefit from this, right? You know, so, um, but yeah, like you have the, you can't demand it. You see what I'm saying? Like if I right. have no indication, like your creatinine is 1.2 and your GFR is 75 and you know, you have very minimal protein. Well, at that point I, I'd be like, leave my kidneys alone. Let me keep them healthy. Some people are like, let me see. Uh, can I, can I bring up another thing too? Yeah. Uh, a side note, there are actually genetic tests out there and I can talk to you about this later, James, if you want, but there's genetic tests out there about that I can actually um, recently come to market that actually can um, detect what kind of genes you have that lead you predisposed to getting different types of kidney disease. Oh. And does it give you the diagnosis itself of the kidney disease that you have? Yeah. Not necessarily, but there are apparently different genes and different markers in your in your blood and your DNA that can tell you, hey, you're predisposed to diabetic nephropathy. Hey, you're predisposed to um, this uh -huh. syndrome, that syndrome. So it's it's interesting, and I think over the next few years, it's going to get really interesting how how healthcare is going to be be run um, and and done. So it's kind of like a twenty three and Me for your kidneys, but sometimes you need to know what to do with it. So it's kind of at the beginning yeah. stages. It's kind of like when you get 23 and me and you figure out you're like 50% Scottish and like, what, do I wear a kilt now? You know, like what are you supposed to do, right? Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, something like that would be great when I was younger, um, <clears throat> if I had known about it, if it was available, um, and somehow someone would have convinced me, yeah. hey, check this out, because that's probably the hardest point or part is to convince me to spend money on something like that. I would have loved to have known, hey, you have a good chance of kidney issues. Here's some things you should keep an eye out. Let's eat a little healthier. Let's uh, let's get that waist a lot smaller. Yeah, the uh, problem is when we're young, we're stupid, right? Yeah. And, so, like, and we're kind of- And cheap. I'm not, I don't want to spend money on that extra stuff that isn't going to help me today. I'm yeah, living for yeah, now, you got that party to not go to tomorrow. Night, right? Yeah. yeah. And so- and, and you're resilient too. I remember like, you know, like I remember those like gaining weight in college and being like, okay, I'll go running this weekend and burn off Exactly. Pounds, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, now, now I'm like, I, I see my kids jump off a swing. And I'm like, oh, that would break my knees. Don't oh do that God, in front yeah. of me. Yeah. <laughs> so how so, long does it take for the biopsy procedure? The procedure itself doesn't take long. It's literally just like you take this needle and you, and you have this like button on the back you stick it, so this is how you do it, okay? So imagine mm -hmm. this is your back, okay? Let's just imagine this is your kidney, right? Okay, there you go, that's your kidney. I'm gonna take a needle, it goes down into the back like this. You guys see my finger? Yep. It's in the back, and then you press, in the back of this uh, needle, you have an, uh, a button, and that injects that needle in quick, punctures it, uh, uh, biopsies it really quick. So again, this goes through, and then when you're at the surface of the, uh, uh, the kidney, you just push it through and just boom, it comes in and out. That's it. And so that's how long it takes technically to do it. 
to do the actual procedure. Not very long at all. Now, one of the complications we do have sometimes, guys, and, you know, again, we're, we're, you got some big boys and big girls in Ohio mm -hmm. and Texas, right? So, you know, when you're really obese, guys, this, this kind of stuff actually makes it more difficult to do because you've got to go through, instead of this much skin, in fact, you got to go through this much skin. Yeah, and we seem to collect so much around our waist. And yeah. have that like so it's not, yeah and extra so holding gets, area. Oftentimes, like it gets difficult, and actually sometimes what's fun, what is interesting is, you know, like even sometimes uh, ultrasound tech. You talk about your ultrasound tech having a hard time finding your kidneys. Oh yeah. But on really obese people, sometimes the ultrasounds don't can't figure it out. Like it, the, the body habitus literally limits the visibility ah. of the ultrasound. Yeah. So there's a lot of complications that can happen. Uh, because so that was another complication I probably added on top of it was. I am not a thin person. No, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying. No, let me tell you something. You're... I'm a pear. It yeah. was bad back then. There was a, there was a lot but, of extra padding. But, but no, no, it's not less than <laughs> someone like yourself. I'm, I'm saying like some of the really obese people, the BMIs, the 35, 40, those kind of people that have really big waist. Sometimes that is me. That is not. You just keep... So the camera takes off a hundred pounds right now. Is that what you're my, I, my camera, I think it does. I, that's why I is use this right? camera. <laughs> you got it. I, you gotta, I, when, I, when I have to do this for work and I'm using my laptop yeah. and I'm looking down this thing, I'm like, oh no no no, I gotta lift it up. Oh, so you got like an Instagram <laughs> filter on right now, right? You got exactly like the yeah. minus one hundred <laughs> one. It's amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, again, I'm not discounting it, guys. So if you're obese, don't think you can't get a kidney biopsy. But, again, we talk about in this in the, on this show a lot about the complications of that high, high blood, uh, obesity and what it mm -hmm. does. And so one of the complications, it can make it difficult to do an ultrasound and sometimes make it difficult to do a biopsy as well, too. So. Yeah, and someone said they got one, and it confirmed that they had IgA vasculitis. Yeah, yeah, that can happen, yeah. too. Yeah. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Abby says, so another you... reason to lose weight. Yes, I am working well, I, on I it. I think vasculitis is not their fault. You see what I'm saying? It's not a behavioral modification thing. It is something mm -hmm. that they're born with. But like the person I just talked about, they had IgA and diabetes and high blood pressure, right? So there's those other things. It's not like you can just have one. You see what I'm yep. saying? So, um, and what, what we're talking about in the United States, guys, so, so you know, and the reason I'm not harping on diabetes and high blood pressure, is because, the reason why I'm harping on it, excuse me, is because it's 65 to 70% of the problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. So 65 to 70% of the people on dialysis today aren't because of diabetes and high blood pressure. We can talk about the vasculitis, the IgA nephropathies, the lupuses, all these anca vasculitis, all these fancy things, polycystic kidney disease, but that's really 30% of the game. Two diseases, diabetes and high blood pressure, are what's causing 70% of the problem right now. And so that's why we, I harp on it. That's why we talk about it a lot because it, can, it really affects your body. It really affects how you do. Yeah, and when I was diagnosed with my kidney disease, I wasn't getting my A1C or anything checked and I was classified pre-diabetic. Now, I had not eaten well, eaten very little for almost a month. The two weeks before going to the ICU, pretty much the only thing I could keep down was like Gatorade no food whatsoever would stay down. Um, but now my A1C looks great. I have worked on my diet, washed my sugar, getting plenty of, of fiber, and you know now not even pre-diabetic. I'm very, very happy with that. I do have a history of high blood pressure. Um, that plus a, a year of using ibuprofen every day for back pain from a car accident just ooh, put me over. Yeah. And again, so, so someone like yourself, when we talked about your history, you know, mm -hmm. your clinical history kind of points to some things, right? And um, the yep. sheer fact that your kidney function got better, both with behavioral modification, which is like awesome, James, but also stopping those NSAIDs, right? So yes. it gave your, gave your time, gave your time's kidney could recover and you made those positive changes in your life. Uh, and uh, those of you out there, I, I'm, a, I'm still a firm believer in positive changes and behavioral changes having massive effects on people. And hey, it really doesn't can. hurt. And if I need a transplant, I need to be yeah. healthier. So at yeah. least I'm headed in that direction in case 
that day ever does come. And, and let's let's give some positive uh, positive notes out there for some people with late stage kidney disease. Those of y'all in CKD four, maybe even coming close to five. Um, you know, uh, America is changing as far as our kidney health and how we're approaching kidney health. So uh, President Trump had an executive order on kidney disease to mm -hmm. CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is going to change the way they reimburse doctors for kidney health. And so what they're going to emphasize is home dialysis at home, but also preemptive transplants, guys. So what that means is when your GFR gets to 20, even right now, when your GFR gets to 20 or less, you should be referred to a transplant center. The goal, though, is not to only get you referred to a transplant center and get you on the list early, but to get you on that transplant list early enough to where you can get a transplant before you even need dialysis. You see what I'm saying? Oh, so that would be awesome. So that's, that's where we're going. So but the thing is about kidney transplants, and maybe this will change in the future, but remember I talked about, you know, sometimes uh, people with excessive BMIs too big, mm -hmm. they can have a hard time getting kidney biopsies. Guess what? A lot of transplant centers have a cutoff, I think, of BMI of 35, right? Yeah, I've, seen, so, I've heard 30 and 35. 35 yeah. is kind so of on the stretch on the side. Center, it depends on depends on what they're comfortable with. So, you know, this is where we're talking about positive changes, right? We're talking about lifestyle modifications you know, which offset diabetes and high blood pressure. Believe me or not, you lose 20, 30 pounds. You're going to come off some diabetes medication. You're going to come off some uh, high blood pressure medication. Hell, you may come off them all both, you know, to some degree, you know? So you're going to improve your overall health. Let's just say you do all that. Your kidney function is still declining, right? Let's just say it's still declining. You didn't have a, a massive reversal like James did. Let's just say you did that, but you made all those positive changes. Guess what? Your body now is still a candidate for kidney transplant, right? As opposed to what it was before. So if you made those changes over time, um, that, that, that's going to have overall effect. Now, maybe it may, it's too late to affect your kidney, but it's not too, it's not too late to affect your chance of getting a kidney transplant, right? Yep. And or, you may even uh, slow down that decline. You may not realize it. Absolutely. But you absolutely. lost some weight. You're watching your, you got your diabetes under control, your blood pressure's under control. You may still be declining in kidney function. But maybe you kind of put the brakes on to slow it down, to buy you more time, I'm, I'm get a healthier, believer, get a I, transplant. Yeah, I'm a firm believer of this. Like, so, I, you know, I haven't seen any data on it because unfortunately American medicine concentrates more on pharmaceuticals. And, but, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that diet modification, lifestyle modification, not only affects your kidney progression, and it does if you, you improve it, but also just your mental health your overall satisfaction with your life, your happiness, everything else. So if you guys are serious about your health, the, you know, people, you, I know your audience probably has a million questions for me. What can I do to help my kidneys? What can I do? Improve always, last time always those questions. Oh, oh, it's like, oh, can I drink cranberry juice? Oh, I got this vitamin from Mexico. And you know, like, right now it's know? celery for some reason. I think there's a Facebook group saying that if oh, you eat celery, it, oh, it heals your God. kidneys. I know. Oh, God, yeah. So, <laughs> You know, I'm not against celery sticks. I'm not against cranberry, but what I'm hey, they make a great about, snack. Yeah, they, they do. I mean, they're delicious. Okay, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, overall, whatever you can do overall, the kidneys are the canary in the coal mine, guys. It's the canary in the coal mine in your kidneys, right? And and whatever your body, whatever wherever whatever mind they're in, whatever body they're in, they're affected by that. So you improve that mind, you improve that body, it's going to improve your kidneys. I'm a guarantee you. I've seen people mm -hmm. have dramatic uh, dramatic increases improvements i've seen people come off of diabetic medications high blood pressure medications again this was not me this was when they made those changes in their lives so yeah and it, it improves the quality of life too besides you know maybe even getting you off some medications like right now you know I'm, I'm, i've gained a lot of weight since covid i've eaten oh, the too COVID, much the covid 15 the covid 15 sir <laughs> what is oh, it COVID I'm, 19? Yeah, I'm not eating the wrong foods i'm eating too many too much and i'm not getting out i see people walking i walked this morning i'm gonna walk tonight i'm not walking enough yeah. um but my but even with that i feel so much better eating better taking care of myself I'm able to do things with my kids. We went to Florida at the beginning of last year before all the lockdowns. Went to SeaWorld. I was walking around doing great. Before, I was exhausted, not just from my kidneys, but from being so out of shape. So yeah. all those things, besides helping my my kidneys, you know, kind of take some of the burden and burden and the the pounding off of them, it's improved my quality of life. So there's so many reasons to make those changes. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And so, um, but yeah, like, and again, like, 
you know, like it's about getting in early, right? The earlier steps mm -hmm. really do matter. Um, you know, uh, you know, if you got anyone out there, CKD three, you know, or even two to some degree, if you have some protein in the urine, these changes can have dramatic effects on you for later on. Um, you can tell like some people like, you know, like yourself, James, like you had high blood pressure for many years, right? And didn't address mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, and unfortunately that had consequences, but if he had addressed it back then, just taking those pills, maybe lost the weight, it wouldn't have progressed. Right. So again, yep. those early changes, guys, when you first find out you have kidney disease, and this is where, this is what's awesome right now, what's going on with kidney health and kidney care in America is that we're doing a, what we call a more upstream approach. Meaning for years we've in, in America, we've concentrated on the downstream, meaning dialysis, dialysis access, maybe transplant, all that kind of stuff and said, Hey, this is where we need to save money. This is where we need to fix things, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? By the time they get there, it's too late and it's really mm -hmm. expensive. So now we're having an upstream approach, meaning instead of CKD, uh, ESRD and CKD5, we're saying CKD4, CKD3, and early detection of CKD as, is what's going to really propel America and, and improve kidney health for these patients. And, um, you know, so that's what's interesting about what's going on. Even insurance carriers, commercial insurance carriers, Medicare, they're all getting into this kind of mindset. Oh, that's about, good. About and I'd like to see them early. cover more dietitians. To help. I agree with you. And I've actually talked yeah. to some of these companies. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, what's interesting is we, if those of you guys in Texas, if you have an HEB, I'm not plugging HEB. And the funny thing about HEB is HEB is a grocery store in San, in, in, in San Antonio and in Texas, right? Uh -huh. H, H E, the B is butt. It's not my, my it's not my family, but <laughs> I wish it were. But, you know, but um, anyway, this grocery store actually provides um, uh, dietitians. Um, and so you go to the pharmacy department, they're typically right next to the pharmacy department, not yep. every branch, but in a lot of the branches, and you can actually have a form about what diseases you have and they can go over the diet you need and then actually walk you down the aisle. And <gasps> See, show that you. is a great service. Help you That's find the right foods, help you kind of understand about making the, the better choices for you. Yeah. That is awesome. And the other thing is, so um, out there, so you guys are when you're talking about diet. So I think Medicare has some sort of certain amount of visits that you can get a CKD. Yeah, it's not much. Medicare. It's not much. I think it's like four to six a year or something. Some commercial carriers I've heard go up to, I've talked to dietitian nine to 10 or maybe even more. But uh, okay, let's just say you have commercial carrier, you have Medicare doesn't have, um, doesn't cover it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest with you guys. It's probably going to cost you 50 to a hundred bucks a session to talk to this dietitian. Worth it. Wherever it. Huh? Worth it. We're, it's definitely totally worth, worth it. it. Totally worth it. Get you a good dietitian, one that you understand, one that you like, one that lives the lifestyle that you want to live. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it's just like you want to get a personal trainer that's fat, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like yeah. So you want to get someone that lives the lifestyle and can tell you um, and and knows about kidney health. That's a big thing. So go find a dietitian that knows about kidney health. Not just a kidney dietitian, you know, like not just somebody who works at Davida or Fresenius or US mm -hmm. Renal, the dialysis chains. What I mean by that is someone that knows a kid's kidney health, knows about diabetes, and can address it for you. And that hundred bucks you spend, and maybe you don't have to see every month, but maybe four times a year, something like that, mm -hmm. that's gonna have dividends that you will never see. I mean, you can imagine being a patient, a kidney disease patient, especially on dialysis, the amount of co-pays you have, the amount of doctor's appointments you have, the amount of pill burden you have. So again, you may think, oh my God, it's $100. Uh, but, it, and I'm not speaking to everyone's, um, you know, so socioeconomic condition or their income right. or whatever. What I'm trying to say is that hundred dollars will have such a big impact. And a lot it's of an investment in yourself and your future. Yeah. It's yourself. Yeah. And so you, and I'm a big fan of exercise too. I don't want to go over exercise, but diet is 80% of the game guys. So a lot of people out there will try to run it off or, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's elliptical trainer it off or join CrossFit for two weeks or whatever, you know, like <laughs> two weeks. That's things. a long one. You, yeah. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is if you just, if you just stuck to a diet uh, or mm -hmm. uh, started restricting your diet slowly, dude, you could have massive, massive returns on that. Yeah. And one of the cool things we're, we're getting to the top of the hour here, but I wanted to get this in there. One of the cool things about a renal dietitian or even a dietitian, a renal dietitian, someone who specializes in kidney disease for those of you out there. Uh, I work very closely with mine. I don't visit them that often. In the beginning, I did because I had to learn how to shop, how to make food, how to fit things that I want in. Now, 
I, I really don't need to. I've learned so much from them that I could just visit once a quarter, every three months, just check up and say, hey, here's how I'm doing. Hey, here's some challenges I'm having. I put on some extra pounds. Here's what I'm thinking of doing to lose it. And they can help guide me. And it is so worth it. And I run into so many people who will say, uh, you know, I have ch problems affording a dietitian, but I did spend $97 on a PDF that says how to cure kidney disease. And I bought these supplements that are supposed to fix kidney disease for $200. Don't buy those things. Don't waste your money on those things. Yeah. Invest in yourself, work with your healthcare team, put the time, effort, and money towards that. Yeah. And, and, and guys like, you know, I'm hoping that healthcare, the healthcare systems, including um, and convert carry, commercial carriers, commercial insurance carriers and uh, Medicare will make these changes and help address some of these issues. But, you know, it, what you're doing right now is educating yourselves, right? You're watching mm -hmm. this, you follow James and hopefully follow me as well, but you edu you're educating yourself. So when you're educating yourselves, you need to actually take charge of your health, right? Don't just take what we say and say, oh, okay, I watched the video. You don't, you don't win by osmosis, right? You mm -hmm. have to actually implement these changes in your life. So if you can do that, man, and it, it'd be incredible. And uh, one more thing, James, like, so we're talking about diet changes. I just yep. dropped a video on plant-based diet and you guys can check it out on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, but you can check that out. But again, I say in that video, dude, go slow, make sl subtle changes. Plant-based diets are beneficial to the kidneys, but I know how it is. We all culturally eat meat. We're Americans, right? We may come from cultures, Hispanic, Asian, white, whatever it is. We eat meat, but we may need to eat less meat. So instead of taking a plant-based diet and saying, oh, I'm going to be completely veggie and not eat anything meat, maybe I just shift it to half the meat I'm eating or a third of the meat I'm eating. Do you see what I'm saying? And start sub subtly there. Cut out those carbs. You know, we're talking about low-carb mm -hmm. diets. I'm a fan of low-carb diets. Dude, I know you all are drinking soda. Stop the soda. You know, don't go all, oh, get rid of all the It's awful the to drink your calories. Oh. Yeah, it's awful. So do subtle things and maintain them, then do the next step. Don't do cold turkey stuff, dude. There's very few people that can do cold turkey stuff. I, I would guarantee you. I, I, I can't see I can't see so many people that will just do cold turkey for like two weeks, like CrossFit for oh. two weeks. And, and then, then you burn out, together. you go back. Even So I've been eating a, a very plant-based diet now, almost two and a half years. I still eat meat this weekend. Yeah, this last weekend, um, I visited family and I had some chicken breast with mm -hmm. you know veggies. I will still scramble some eggs from time to time in the morning. I have not eliminated meat. I've done, like you said, I've reduced it and I've added a lot more vegetables. I now eat yes. things like asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower. I, my breakfast this morning, was a vegetable spread. I had some celery, yeah. carrots, broccoli, and cauliflower. And that was my breakfast this morning. I got up, I ate it while I was getting ready for work. Boom. Yeah. Um, probably tonight I might have a little a chicken breast maybe. Oh. But yeah. I, 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 I can't even go cold turkey two and a half years later and I don't have to. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm just eating healthier. I just gotta keep an yeah. eye on those snacks. Yeah. Now one yeah, last no, one. One last question before we get, or we run out of time. Um, as far as a kidney biopsy goes, is this something that a person just gets once or is there sometimes a reason to get another biopsy at a later point? So there are some, some scenarios where you may need to get it again. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, certain autoimmune diseases have a chance, have a tendency to reoccur. Um, lupus can actually affect your kidneys in six different ways. And so you want to know which way is attacking. So sometimes, you know, you'll see a progression over time, GFR declining, things like that. So you want to see if that's active. There are other diseases that are what we call active, where they get kind of, I don't want to say what word is hot, but <laughs> they like I, it is a, there's a type of vasculitis associated with IgA nephropathy that can kind of start acting up sometimes. And so you may need to get a biopsy again here and there. But it really depends on the person and how well their kidneys are, kidneys are holding up and if they're declining or not or how much protein they're losing and all that kind of stuff. So um, for the most part, though, if it's diabetes, high blood pressure or something simple, it'd probably just be one time. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. Um, but if it's an autoimmune disease, perhaps numerous biopsies may be needed. If you have a kidney transplant, too, guys, if you oh. guys are out there who have a kidney transplant, 
oftentimes in the, in the setting of possible acute rejection where the GFR is going down or something's happening with a, you know, creatinine is going up and they're like, what's going on? They may just do repeated biopsies. So people with kidney biopsies oftentimes have multiple ones. So that's another, another case where people have multiple biopsies. Cool. Well, we are now at the top of the hour. This is a very oh. informative um, show tonight. How many tonight. people had biopsies? How many people had biopsies? A lot of them or what? We had quite a few that said they had okay. biopsies. Here's someone, I'm not going to butcher your last name person, because um, I'm really bad at it. He said um, he had it was diagnosed with acute tubular in. Nephritis, <laughs> long okay. word. <laughs> you know, we've probably had, I, I'd say probably a dozen or more people who said they have had a biopsy. Um, someone earlier said they had one, it was, it was practically nothing. It, you know, it was easy to recover from, which was great to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, Every, everyone noticed your dogs. I didn't know you had dog a dog, at least one. Yeah, we got a COVID dog, man. That's our, yeah, so it's our, it's our COVID 45. We picked up 45 pounds of dog, I guess. Yeah. There you go. What kind of dog is it? Uh, we, I, I, so it was a mutt. It's a, so it's a, it was one of those, it was a rescue. So we got our rescue. Awesome. I kind of Googled it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, there's so many, there's so many homeless dogs. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. why get a new one? And so anyway, so, um, I, I Googled it. I looked at her face and I was like, okay, I think you're, I think you're a Dalmatian. So I think it's a Dalmatian pointer mix. And that's just my go. I didn't do a 23 and me on my dog. Or yep, anything. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's what I think we got. Yeah. So. Hey, that's great. And I'm so glad to hear it's a rescue. We have two rescues that are, uh, I think 13 and 14 years old. We've had so many rescues over that's the cool. years. Yeah, I know fan. people that pay two thousand dollars for breeded dogs, and I'm like, oh, you do that? and, and when yeah. you get a breeded dog, their life tends to be shorter because the DNA isn't as fresh, or there's not enough variety in it. Where you get a, a mixed breed, they tend to to live longer and have less health problems. That is great. Oh, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, Doc. Let me bring up your your. Uh, your information again for anyone looking to connect with Dr. Kossum, but there's his um, Facebook handle right there on the screen. On YouTube, just go in there, search for Your Kidneys, Your Health. You'll see his picture and subscribe to his YouTube channel. There's also a link to both Facebook and YouTube right down below in the description. And if you go to dadvicetv.com, he has an entire section of his guest appearances here, as well as some of his videos that he has created that are nice, short, entertaining, and informative. All right, everybody, I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. This is the last show of this week. I will be back next week, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.